Welcome to the College Research Seminar. I'm Marie Harvey. I'm the Associate Dean for Research for the College of Public Health and Human Sciences here at Oregon State University. And I'm delighted that you're joining this seminar. Um, I'm also really pleased to, to introduce uh, Peggy Dalsini. Peggy is a professor in the Health Promotion Health Behavior Program. And she is also the interim school head for the School of Social and Behavioral Health Sciences. And she's graciously agreed to introduce our speaker and to moderate the session. So I think you're all in for a treat. So I'm gonna pass the baton to you, Peggy. Thanks, Marie. So welcome everyone. And just to note that we are doing this all via Zoom today, a very familiar thing for many of us. Um, for security reasons, we're using a webinar, so microphones are muted. Uh, to ask a question, just use the Q&A feature, and we will moderate and read questions out uh, at the end of the presentation. And I'm delighted to introduce Professor Margarita Lightfoot, our speaker today. Uh, Margarita is the Associate Dean for Research at OHSU PSU School of Public Health and the Naito Meganotti Endowed Professor in Health Equity. Immediately prior to coming to Oregon, she served as professor and director of several federally funded centers at the University of California, San Francisco, including the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies. Marie, Margarita has long been a recognized leader in research addressing health and well being of youth, and her work has a strong emphasis on the development of interventions to reduce HIV AIDS within populations that are disproportionately affected. Um, her work has been consistently funded by NIH and other federal and private agencies, and her publication is record is too extensive to um, go into detail here. Um, today, she'll share some of her work on youth participatory action research, and please welcome Margarita Lightfoot. Thanks so much, Peggy. Uh, appreciate that lovely introduction. So I guess first up, let me share my screen. All right, whoops, you know, I need to share it from the beginning. There we go, all right. Uh, well, so lovely to be here. Thank you for the invitation to uh, speak today. And I wanted to share with you all some of my work um, really centering young people in research in order to make change for young people. Um, and I would say, if I were to characterize my research, I would say my passion really is promoting and supporting the health and well-being of adolescents and adults. And so that, and that's really started from my core when I was young and has gone all the way um, to now. And here's a picture of my son. And I have always been in my, throughout my career, thinking about how do we connect with young people in order to be able to help and promote their health and well-being. And one of the things that was really clear to me early on, early in my career, I was working at a high school and oftentimes young people were talking about, I was working at high school, young people were coming to me, I was a counselor in the high school, talking to me about not knowing where their next meal is gonna be, worried about the violence that they were facing, but they all had video games and this was, 25 years ago. And there's a whole host of reasons. That's a whole nother talk about why families were investing in video games. But one of the things that's been very clear as time has gone on is that in that, that the way that young people connect with technology is incredibly important. So here's my son. He's sitting on his laptop. That's how I saw him most of the time. And so the other thing I've been thinking a lot about is how do we engage young people using the mediums of communication that they use? And so I've been applying that idea to a number of issues that, have, that we know are important for young people. So the first being having young people test for HIV. So we know that lots of young people are having sex, whether we'd like to believe it or not. Uh, but what's more disturbing is that for those young people who are having sex, they are oftentimes not using condoms, not using protection against HIV and STIs, and they're not getting tested so that we can't really identify them and get them connected into services and prevention as we would like. So as this slide shows, when you talk to young people who are sexually active, only 22% of them have been tested for HIV. 
we look at talk to the young people who are saying that they're sexually active and tell us they haven't used a condom the last time they had sex, 30% of those young people have not been tested for HIV. And there's a lot of reasons why young people aren't testing for HIV. You can see on this slide a host of reasons going from um, lack of services, lack of access, and as, as Black Panther here would allude to, just feeling like they can't be sick, that nothing bad is going to happen to them. So there's a number of things that we have to overcome in order to get young people to come in to see us. And so we developed this intervention um, that was intended to really leverage young people and their social networks, their connections to technology to get them to come in to get screened for HIV and STIs. So in this intervention, we asked young people at an adolescent medicine clinic to text message five of their friends that they thought were sexually active to have them come into the clinic. We told them the goal of this is, the goal of your message is to get your friend to come in. And we didn't really tell them what to say. I think it, from my perspective, they were gonna be much more persuasive. To, they're gonna know what to say to their friends, be much more persuasive than anything that I could um, come up with in terms of a message, even if I had like a youth advisory board or something. So we gave young people the parameters. We told them, you know, don't piss your friends off, don't accuse them of anything, but you know, what, give them a message that you think is gonna help them to, and persuade them to come in and get screened themselves because if they're sexually active, chances are that they need to be coming into the clinic. And so we conducted this study as an interrupted time series design. I did this in collaboration with adults at Medicine Clinic in San Francisco. So what we did is we were looking at metrics of the clinic before we started the messaging. So um, from the intake forms, we got information about the young person themselves, the behaviors that they were engaged in, so kind of their risk profile. We were wanting to see how risky young people were, what kinds of risky behaviors were they engaging in. And we were also able to see how many new patients were coming to the clinic, how many new patients were getting HIV and STI tests, how many new uh, positive tests that we were getting to see if after the messaging we were seeing if we were going to be able to see any increases in these numbers. So then we started the messaging and then we followed the clinic, those same clinic metrics for three months after we started the messaging to see if things changed over time. The other thing that we did was when a young person sent the message, we asked them some, you know, we basically did an assessment, a, a small assessment to understand their fears, their thoughts, what, what was going on for them and deciding to send that message. And then we followed up with them again um, a week later to uh, make sure to, well, just to get a sense, did you all talk? Did you and your friend talk about this anymore? Was there any other conflict? We wanted to be able to capture if there's any unintended consequences from having young people send out these messages. We didn't want to ruin any friendships. And so ultimately we wanted to get at least a hundred young people to send out these messages. And so that meant that we approached 153 young people at this, at this medical clinic. Most of them said that they would do it. We had about tw almost 20% of them said that they wouldn't do it. And usually that was because they said they just didn't have time, that they didn't want to uh, stay after their doctor's appointment to then do this messaging. And then we had about 16% who were ineligible. And that ineligibility was really a reflection of they didn't have their phone with them or they didn't have enough friends in their phones that they could message. So of those who consented, as you can see, most young people um, sent the message, five messages like we asked. What was interesting is almost 20% of young people sent more messages than we asked. We uh, weren't paying the young people to send the messages. We were trying to develop a sustainable intervention, and we knew that the clinics themselves themselves wouldn't be able to be paying young people. We did pay them for the interviews after. And so um, it's interesting to me that young people even chose to do more than what we asked, even though we weren't giving them incentives for it. The other th interesting thing was that young people sent um, tailored messages to their five friends. So they didn't come up with one message and send the same message to all five friends. They were sending messages specifically to their friends um, that, they, that were really tailored. And then as you can see here, most of the young people, we were able to find them later and do that post-test. And so to give you, so we did it, so we had all of the uh, text messages that the young people sent. So we wanted to do a thematic analysis to understand um, 
what do young people think is persuasive? If given this opportunity, what kinds of things did they decide to do? What kinds of messages did they decide to send? And so there are basically four different kinds of messages. The first category is the largest. Most of the messages, unsurprisingly, were about a call to action, asking their friend to do something. Sometimes the call of action was active. So it was like, please, you know, you need to do this or, um, whoops, why am I? Okay, there we go. Here's a so this is a, a one of the text messages. So it was really telling their friend, you need to get checked out. You need to come to the clinic. It was a, a really a, an active uh, call to action. Some of the call to action messages were more passive. So they were just saying, telling someone, you need, hey, there's this clinic out here. You could find out your status if you go into this clinic. So it was still telling their friend to do something without that um, more active uh, messaging. The second kind of message that young people sent, unsurprisingly, were personalized messages, meaning they were saying something specifically to their friend and uh, that was specific to their friend's situation. And so like in this example, it was like, make sure you get checked out, right? So they were saying something that they thought their friend uh, would be uh, salient to their friend. The third kind of um, messages were clinic, the messages that just provided clinic information. So they were, they told their friend about where the where the name of the clinic, where it was located, the services the clinic uh, provided. So they provided some information to that. And then the last one was because the young people were in the clinic at the time that they sent the message. Um, some of them, over half, said something personal about the fact that they themselves had gotten services from that clinic or um, had were there currently, um, as this particular quote um, illustrates. So they were sharing as a way, sharing some personal information as a way to help their friend to uh, persuade their friend to also come into the clinic. So we, in that, in that uh, post-test that we were talking to young people about, we asked young people who to send the message to. Unsurprisingly, they sent the messages to the people that we asked them to, friends that they thought were sexually active. They also sent messages to friends who are more close and who they thought, who said they said they frequently texted with. So they weren't, it wasn't a random message to someone they hadn't talked to in a long time. It was basically messaging people that they had been messaging before. We also asked young people if they had any concerns about sending out the message. Most of the young people said they had no concerns at all with sending out the message. The reality is they send out things that are a lot more provocative than what we were asking them to, to message about. Um, we had some young people talk about feeling like they were worried about what their friends might say um, and how their friend might react to the message. About 20% of the young people talked about that. And interesting also, there were a number of young people who were worried about whether or not the message would actually work, whether it would get the kind of response that they were looking for. They were worried that their friend won't remember to go to the clinic or that they won't take the advice that was in a text message or um, something like that. So that's um, so there was that worry about them, that message not having the impact that we wanted it to have. Um, because young people are at the clinic at the time that they were getting the, sending the message, most of us, most messages are, we all open our message within, I think it's six seconds of actually receiving it. So if we, if a young person's friend responded to that text message, then we had the opportunity to see what that response was. And so these are examples of some of the responses that young people receive from their friends. And again, it, re it reinforced this idea that not only did young people who we asked to send the message feel like it was okay, the young people receiving the messages also felt like it was acceptable. In general, the messages were really positive, um, uh, responses were positive and that indicated that they were appreciative of the messages that their friends had sent to them. So did it work? That's really the question. Did it get um, the kinds of outputs at the clinic that we were hoping to see. So here you can see the on the left side is the purple line. That's what happened before we started sending out the messages. On the right side, the green line indicates the number of patients who were getting a positive STI after we started sending the messages. And as you can see that the trend went higher once we started sending, having patients send messages. We were really uh, identifying more uh, young people that were STI positive. We also wanted to know about whether or not a young, that pr risk profile of the patients of the young people were changing that were coming in. And by high risk, I'm talking about young people who had an STI, uh, had multiple partners, or 
um, had sex without condoms. And so again, as you can see, the purple line on the left is before the messaging, the green line on the right is after the messaging, and that trend is going up. Once we started messaging that the young people who were coming in afterwards were exhibiting more high-risk behavior. Same with in terms of um, actually identifying young people that were HIV positive. We were seeing more patients being identified as positive once we started the messaging, as well as with STIs. Now, these were, again, we only had, what, 100 young people sending messages. So the data I'm just showing you is not statistically significant. It's really more intended to show you the trends. But, the, but clearly, it's also showing that this idea, this approach is acceptable to young people, that they're willing to send out messages to friends, kind of cold calling, cold messaging their friends, and that that messaging, um, and those were messages were acceptable um, based on what we heard talking to young people later, as well as the, the responses they were seeing when text messaging. So this seems to be a really a, a kind of promising approach. So we tried this approach uh, in a different context where we were thinking, okay, if we were going to be doing this kind of messaging intervention, uh, countries in Africa may be a great place to be looking at because uh, no matter which country you're talking about in Africa, the number of mobile phones or cell phones actually exceed what we're seeing here in Europe and in the US. They don't have the infrastructure for hard wired phones. And so that really uh, provided or kind of illustrates the potential for this kind of approach happening elsewhere as well. So we did this, we did this work also in Zimbabwe um, connecting with or collaborating with partnering with a, a adolescent medicine clinic in Zimbabwe that had comprehensive sexual reproductive services that were free for young people and that were centrally located. And so in Zimbabwe itself, we were seeing very similar numbers in terms of over half of young men in this age, in the adolescent young adult age range, 16 to 24, had never had a, a, a t, um, test for HIV for young women. That rate is higher, like 30 or lower, I should say, 30, about 30%, 35% of young women had never been tested for HIV. And typically they're getting tested because they're going into um, prenatal care. But even then, given the amount of young people who are testing positive, this also seemed to be a population that was worth seeing if we could influence. So the, the our design was very similar, interrupted time series design. This time though, we, were, we followed the clinics uh, and their data for much longer periods of time because we wanted to take into account things like weather and rainy seasons and all of those kinds of things in terms of controlling for um, the seasonality uh, across time. And then after the messaging, we had, um, we measured for another another 52 weeks afterwards to see what kind of changes happened over time. And so this gives you an example of some of the text messages that the young people sent in Zimbabwe. The text messages were sent in the local language, Shona. So these are, these are actually um, translations of Shona um, text messages. The interesting thing that was a little different from what we were seeing when we did this work in the US is that the young people in Zimbabwe, they did choose one message and they sent that same message to the five friends, as opposed to, as I mentioned, in, in um, San Francisco, young people were doing a little bit more targeting. The other thing was in San Francisco, most of the young people were self sent their mess. All of the young people actually sent their messages using SMS. Whereas in, in Zimbabwe, uh, most of the messages were being sent via WhatsApp. Some young people used uh, Facebook Messenger and then a fewer, uh, much fewer used SMS. So in each case, we let the young people decide how they were gonna be sending, what platform they were to use. So that just gives you a sense of what platform they chose to use. So again, did we see anything change over time. So when we look here at the number of new patients that were testing for HIV at this adolescent medicine clinic, before the messaging on the left is that purple line. You can see that that was going down over time. The number of patients testing for HIV went down. Once we started doing the messaging, that red line reflects after the messaging started. There was a jump in the number of young people getting tested and that number kept going up. So it didn't have that downward slope that we were seeing before the messaging. 
And so, in fact, it was doubling. We saw a doubling in the number of new patients getting tested for HIV uh, after, after the messaging. Similarly, when we looked at the number of patients who were test, new patients who were testing positive for HIV, so are we identifying more young people who are uh, living with HIV? Before the messaging, that purple line, as you can see, it's relatively flat. But before uh, the messaging started, once we started doing the messaging, there was a little bit of a jump and it also remained flat, but at a higher level. So we were seeing, again, more young people who were engaging in higher risk, who were testing positive for HIV as a result of the messaging. And in fact, that number was five times higher um, once we started doing messaging than before. And then lastly, that we, again, were looking at number of patients, what the risk profile of patients look like. So the proportion of the new patients coming in who exhibited sexual risk behaviors, who had multiple partners, had an STI, or um, said they were having sex but didn't use condoms. Again, that number is going down before we're doing the testing on that purple line. The messaging starts, and then there's that big jump, and it continues to go up and, and trend up that red line after we started doing messaging. So it was three times um, higher, uh, as a, three times higher in terms of the number, the proportion of new patients that were exhibiting sexual risk behavior. So all of these numbers, we had larger samples here, three, we're talking about 3,000 patients coming to the clinic versus in um, the prior San Francisco study, we had about 300 young people. So this time we can really test for statistical significance. And as you can see, all of these were significantly significant, significant, statistically significant over time. So really helping young people uh, and leveraging and engaging young people as not only messengers, but the interventionists seemed to be a really um, important approach for engaging young people. I wanted to switch gears and talk a little bit about how not only were we doing intervention or engaging young people to for intervention work, um, this study that I'm going to talk about now, we actually engage young people as the researchers, the interviewers, and we uh, worked with them on analyzing the data. And I think because of that, we have much richer data as a result. So this particular study was looking at the intersection of homelessness, criminalization, and violence for young people experiencing homelessness. Here on this picture you see as our research team, all of the young people on our research team had either lived experience with homelessness themselves or um, had worked with young people who had experiencing homelessness through a peer, in peer models. So we had some UC Berkeley students, as well as young people who are graduating from the leadership program in our, with our community collaborator, Larkin Street Youth Center in San Francisco. And so um, these young people were not, you know, had not had a lot of training, uh, academic training. However, we were able to engage them in helping us to collect data and, um, and analyze and interpret our data. So in this particular study, we did four different things. We Young people went out on this, to the streets of San Francisco and talked to other young people who were experiencing homelessness. And we were trying to understand what were the young people's daily existence like? Where were they feeling safe? Where were they feeling unsafe? Um, where were they interacting with police? Where were they... Uh, Interact, when were they having being victims of violence? So when were they engage, encountering violence? And so young people toured us around. They took, we took a, the, they took the interviewer, the youth interviewer on a walking tour of their neighborhood and talked about where they felt safe, where they felt unsafe, where they were encountering violence. As they were doing those neighborhood tours, they also took pictures of places that they thought that they would indicate really illustrated what they were saying. And we were able to, because those pictures were geolocated, we would have, um, we could map out the geolocation of all of these important safe and unsafe spaces, places where young people could get services, places um, where they were encountering violence. We were able to map that out in the city. And then lastly, we worked with the San Francisco Police Department to look at their data so that we can understand when are young people being stopped. Now their data set doesn't say that a young person is homeless or not, but 
we do know, but it does have the age range, the age of every person that was stopped. And so we could, und- so the whole point of all of this is so that we could really understand what are the, the policies, the procedures, the laws that were really um, endangering young people, having them encounter with um, with the police in particular, because we had been hearing from young people that when we were talking to them about violence, the encounters that they were having police were one of the things that came up a lot. So we really also wanted to understand that as well. So here you can see that there there is um, a map of San Francisco and these orange dots are places that young people told us that they were experiencing violence. The light blue dots are places where they um, indicated that they felt safe. And then these dark kind of teal dots are places where young people said that they could find resources, where they could get food, hygiene kits, counseling, those kinds of things. And one of the things that really jumps out when looking at this map is there's a lot of uh, resources bunched up right here, but also there's a lot of violence right here. So what young people were telling us is that we're asking them oftentimes to come from all over these safe spaces they had. They had to traverse the city to come into unsafe spaces in order to get the services that they need. So a lot of agencies in San Francisco uh, that serve populations experiencing homelessness are very concentrated in certain parts of the city. And those parts of the city also provide services to adults. And so, and and many of these adults were um, suffering from substance abuse issues, mental health challenges. And so young people were having to go to agencies that were in the cities, uh, in these concentrated areas where they were gonna encounter adults. That, they, that were very unsafe for them. So that was one of the big take home messages that we found um, that young people told us about. Uh, this is a quote from one of those walking interviews. Another thing that we found in doing this work, uh, and by the way, every picture that you'll see here are pictures that young people took when we were doing the walking interviews. So one of the things that young people told us is that oftentimes they don't have access to just basic needs. So you can see in this picture, the the water faucet's been locked, so they can't have access to just water, right? So things like food, uh, hygiene, bathrooms, everywhere they go, oftentimes they're being blocked from having access to these things. And so it was one of the issues that young people talked a lot about when um, being homeless that they had to encounter and overcome. Another thing young people told us a lot about is they felt stigmatized um, for, for being homeless. And so this young person, this is all of their possessions and they were very intentional about ensuring that they didn't carry a lot of stuff around because if they carried a lot of stuff around or they looked dirty they looked unkept, then um, they had even less access to what they needed. Businesses wouldn't let them come into their stores. Um, They would get harassed at places. Um, They would be more likely to be stopped by a cop if they're slaying on the sidewalk, sitting on the sidewalk. So they they did a lot of, they had to do a lot in order to have this um, outward appearance that would reduce the amount of stigmatization they would experience. So this is an, another big piece of kind of the emotional violence that young people are experiencing as a result of just trying to survive. This uh, also young people were not only stigmatized, but oftentimes they were criminalized for being um, for being homeless. So this uh, Buena Vista Park is one area of Golden Gate Park. So if anyone's ever been to San Francisco, we have a there's a huge urban park in San Francisco called Golden Gate Park. This is one area and young people would often, and it's a park that you would typically, like any other park, lots of families, people roller skating, people laying around, having picnics, hanging out, sleeping. But for young people, um, it became, uh, they weren't allowed to do many of those things. So this this, um, sign that's up here tells you about the park, but then also the sign is saying you can't loiter. And as this young person aptly put it, like, what are you supposed to do at a park? 
but loiter. And so these young people, if they, and this is a way for them, uh, for the city to keep young people from hanging out too long, laying on the grass. And young people would talk about if they were doing any of those things, sitting in a place for a long period of time, anything that you and I would do at a park, that would be reason for young people who are experiencing homelessness to be harassed, told to move on. Um, and so they weren't able to just experience the kinds of things that you and I would experience just being at a park because of the laws that we have in place around how long you can sit on a sidewalk, you can't lay on a bench, all these things that kept uh, young people from, uh, kept young people feeling criminalized. The other thing that young people told us a lot about is that there, we know that there are a lot of services in place that are supposed to help them. But one of the things that young people told us about that those who are, who are supposed to help them sometimes actually hurt them. Not surprisingly, one of the groups that they talked a lot about were law enforcement. Now, not every police, uh, police officer was bad. And young people did talk about there's the occasional police officer that helped them. But more so, there's much more of a narrative from these young people about law enforcement um, enacting violence against, against them, enforcing rules that um, they had excessive force, and taking away their possessions, making them move and not letting them take their possessions with them. So in general, there's just the sense from, that police, the law enforcement oftentimes were have or an unsafe space for young people. So they didn't say, feel safe around uh, police officers. And oftentimes they were really the victims and uh, that's where they would engage with a lot of violence. Um, as, this, as this quote said, this young pe person talked about the police not feeling safe at all for them. Another group that young people talked about they would think were folks who are supposed to be helping them, but sometimes hurt them were actually the service providers themselves who were at uh, youth serving organizations for these young people. So again, young people talked about that often some of these providers felt welcoming the places they were treated like, like human beings, um, but there was also the experiences of feeling disrespected, that the adults were paternalistic, that they were controlling, um, and that those and that they were really gatekeepers to services that young people needed. So if a young person needed to get food, they had to act, you know, that sometimes these adults very, very much um, enforce rules very um, like harshly and inconsistently across people. And they talked about providers having favorites. And and so the young people felt a lot like um whether it's case managers or case workers or desk, desk staff, that oftentimes those folks were barriers to them being able to get kind of access to just basic care, that they would be kicked out for um, small infractions. Um, and that these adults had a lot of power over these young people. And as a result, um, young people were not able to always access their basic needs because of it. And then when we looked at the police stop data for the two years that we were actually out there doing the, the tours with young people, when we looked at um, the stop was for some kind of physical infraction, as you can see here, there were a little over 2000 stops for that. Most of them were young men. Many of the stops happened in what's what's uh, called the baby neighborhood in San Francisco, which is the traditionally African-American black neighborhood in San Francisco. So most of the stops happen there. And as you can see, uh, in terms of the demographics of, of young people getting stopped, almost half of the young people getting stopped were black. Now keep in mind that the population of black folks in San Francisco is about 6%. So, and for, for Hispanic Latinx folks, um, it's about 23%. And so you can see there's definitely a disproportionate um, number of young people of color being stopped. When we looked at property crimes, um, again, kind of the same pattern, mostly black young people happening in the black neighborhoods. The Tenderloin is another area in San Francisco that's predominantly African-American and Latinx. And so a lot of um, stops and over-policing in those areas. When we look at drug possession, 
again, very similar um, similar story here. The difference being that most of the drug possession stops were happening among Hispanic, Latinx young people because they were in a particular neighborhood, the Tenderloin, where there was a lot of um, drug activity happening, uh, but it also happens to be the neighborhood that not surprisingly is also going to be more low income, have more people of color. And then we look at um, crimes that are homelessness related, again, more young people of color being stopped. The one um, interesting difference here is that you'll see more young women are being stopped for this particular crime. And that's because um, this variable includes uh, sex work as, as a, a crime against people who are on the streets trying to survive. And so more young people, female young people are being stopped for, for sex work. So given all of this picture, all of the work that we did here, we went and presented this to this data to our uh, colleagues in the San Francisco Police Department, uh, the, the walking tour qualitative data, as well as this quantitative data of, uh, analysis of their own data. And as a result of this, we were able to see some changes happening in San Francisco. One is the kind of what we're seeing all over now, um, but early on it's happening in San Francisco is that when there's a young person who is distressed, that the police department now will call the agency, that our partner agency, Larkin Street, to respond as opposed to having police be the first responders. Because they were recognizing that they were not the best people to be the first responders and be able to um, address adequately address the needs of young people. Another thing that we saw as a result of our presentation of this data to the um, police department and to the city council is recently, um, two months ago, they built a new or they rehabbed a new facility for housing for and they were um, targeting young people. And initially that housing was going to be in that part of the city where you saw all that concentration of violence. And because of the data that we, uh, our agents, the partner agency was able to share that uh, housing actually was put someplace else. The housing that was um, targeted young people was put into a different uh, part of the city. So again, we were really able to harness the strengths of young people to make changes in the city that really uh, help young people. So I will tell you about one last study that I'm currently working on with collaborators um, in San Francisco at UCSF and also with a uh, community-based agency called MyPath. And in this particular study, um, we're really looking to see, can we change the financial um, trajectories of Black youth over time? And the way that we're um, attempting to do that is by providing young people with a guaranteed income. So this is a study that's being funded by NIH. We are just starting. We start our first recruitments this summer. Um, but I thought I would share just kind of what we're doing and how we're engaging young people in this. So what we're, uh, we'll be providing to young people is a cash transfer. They're going to get a guaranteed income of $500 a month for a year. And they don't have to do anything for it. They're, it's guaranteed. They're not, they don't have to be in any kind of program. They don't have to look for work or all the kinds of other things and stipulations that we typically put on uh, programs that are intended to help lift folks out of poverty. And so we know that the guaranteed income allow, I should say our, our hypothesis is that by providing this guaranteed income that folks are, we kind of free up their brain, free up their stress, free up their ability to be able to think beyond just day-to-day -day survival. So they can then now have more uh, freedom and flexibility to think about what the future might hold for them, what kinds of investments they might wanna make in their future, to go to class, whatever that might be for that young person, that without that daily stress of just surviving, that they'll be now, they'll have space and capacity and bandwidth to be able to do that. Um, and one of the things that this re really reminds me of is that oftentimes our narratives that we've, we've been socialized with is that you have to just work hard and you, you can survive, you can make money, you won't be in poverty. But as this, as this uh, picture, I love this picture because it really illustrates that that is just a false narrative, that in fact, working hard is not going to always get you where you need to go. And so the premise of uh, the, these guaranteed income programs 
they've been there have been a number of these programs uh, pilot programs that have been done with adults and so the for adults what we see is that they have a reduction in anxiety and depression there's increases in investments in their future meaning that they were looking to get better jobs they go to school those kinds of things and we also see in adults that their health seeking behavior so going to the, they're going to the doctor more than they used to when they need to or feel like they need to and they're um, getting services and figuring out how to get those services and utilizing those services, all of that goes up when they have like that base income that allows them to think beyond that day-to-day survival. So we know that this works with adults. So we want to try to see if this works with, uh, with young people as well. Um, and the real interesting, or I think important piece of this is that we have that potential to have an immediate policy impact on these. So um, there are a number of projects that are already happening across the country. Uh, there's the Mayors uh, for Guaranteed Income Alliance that's happening. So whether you're in Mississippi or New York or um, New Mexico, there are these small cities in, um, and small and large cities and everyone in between that are trying guaranteed income programs as a way to help folks who are in poverty. And so what we're hoping to do in this particular study is to determine the impact of guaranteed income on basically three things. We want to understand the impact on the financial, the long-term financial well-being for young people. So we'll be following these young people. Uh, they'll get the income for a year, and then we'll follow them for a year after they've received the income. So we'll get a sense of, are they saving the money? Are they investing in classes or uh, what are they doing with that money and how might that be working towards their future we'll also be looking at their mental health so in particular depression and anxiety and then we'll look at to see given just the age range of these young people we want to ensure we want to see if they're able to access mental health services if they need it and given this developmentally appropriate sexual reproductive health services for these young people, because we know this is the age where there is high rates of STIs and, and pregnancy, unwanted pregnancy. So we want to make sure, we want to see if this is having an impact on those, on those outcomes. Now we are talking about young people, right? So we know that the executive functioning isn't always there, potentially they're not always being planned for. And so we're, we want to build in scaffolding to help young people in the work that they're doing. And so young people will have access to financial capability training uh, alongside their guaranteed income. Now they don't have, again, they don't have to go to these services, extra services. It's just available to them if they want it. So there'll be peer learning circles. There'll be other kind of educational materials and web seminars that they can go to around economic well-being. They'll have a financial coach if they want it. So they'll have some wraparound services to go along with the funding if they want to avail themselves of it. So we're wanting to know if providing these extra services um, might actually increase the benefit that we would see from the guaranteed income by itself. So we're doing a, a randomized controlled crossover design in this study where 300 young people will get uh, will be randomized to either receive that guaranteed income right away or they'll be delayed in receiving their guaranteed income. So they're not going to get the guaranteed income right away. As I mentioned, everyone will have access to those opt-in financial capability training and services throughout the study. And then after a year, the young people who got the, the guaranteed income will stop receiving it. And the young people who had not been receiving it will start receiving it. So we'll be able to, we'll have a year of control to understand like how young people are changing over time. So we have an actual control group. And then when we do that crossover, we'll be able to see what happens to young people once you stop giving them the income. Um, and we'll be following them for that year after that. So we'll be doing quantitative surveys every three months. And um, we will be doing qualitative surveys at baseline at 12 months and 24 months to get more depth of information about what that experience is like for them, what they're doing, how their life is uh, unfolding as a result of, of the income that they may be receiving. So again, this is we're just starting this. I hope to be able to share with you the outcomes of these in a couple of years. So um, I guess if I were to say, if I'm going to end uh, this talk, the take home message is that as we're working with young people 
as I've been working with young people, recognize that they're an important resource in improving health and that we really need to engage them. As you all think, wh whoever you're working with, uh, whatever population of folks, it's your, the focus of your research, it's going to be key and important for you to engage that population uh, in, in order to make the kind of changes and see the kind of outcomes you would like to see. So uh, I think my time is about up. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions that folks might have. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, a whole body of research that um, gives us a perspective on many of the things that you're doing and that have you know, very real world, world implications and, and outcomes. So um, just, just really enjoyed that. I'm gonna start us off with, I have about a million questions. Um, and I, I think I'm gonna start with one that goes back to your, um, your data that showed that youth services were often located in places uh, that were not safe uh, for mm -hmm. you. And I wonder what you think the potential of mobile units for youth services are um, it, to try to address those sorts of problems. Yeah, I think that actually would be, that would be wonderful. So um, having, um, those kinds of mobile services, and I'm thinking broadly about mobile services. So mobile showers, mobile bathrooms, as well as sexual reproductive health services, counseling, um, water faucets, and, and food. Those kind, having those kinds of mobile units that would be uh, deployed throughout the city, I think would actually have a really important impact and, and provide access to young people so they're not required to come into the city. Uh, I think probably part of the challenge for that has been financial, quite frankly. So just the city having the funds to be able to do that kind of a thing. I think they do, they have uh, one or two mobile units that, that have gone out into the city, and, but not youth specific. Um, and I think the other challenge is that for, it's this idea that, you know, where would you deploy them? And oftentimes neighbors, neighborhoods don't like to have those kinds of services provided in their um, in their backyard, but perhaps like having it at the uh, a park or something like that would be a way to get around some of that. But yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you. Let me also encourage those of you who are watching and listening to put questions into the Q and A, and I can read those out as as they they come in. <laughs> While we're waiting for that, um, I was really interested in the, the first studies that you talked about looking at um, sort of youth coming to clinics for testing and both HIV mm -hmm. and STIs and that thing and being encouraged by their friends. And, you know, you may know that's been certainly the friendship piece has been a very interesting area for me uh, in my work over time as well. But more recently, our team has been looking at self-testing, self-HIV testing as a really valuable tool, both among youth as well as um, uh, in other populations. And did you, did you consider self-testing in any of this work that you were doing? Was it part of any of that? And again, do you see, what kind of potential do you see there with these uh, youth generated messages and encouraging self testing. Yeah. So, for this particular study, we did not think about self testing primarily, I think, because it was one of the goals. Uh, th the genesis for this project really came from my working with the Adolescent Medicine Clinic. And one of the goals that they had were to bring more young people into the clinic. And so they, um, felt like they weren't reaching the most risky young people. So a lot of the young people who were coming to the clinic were, you know, had young people coming in to get tested for STIs, but they, they just had a sense that there's probably more of that needed um, in the community. A lot of young people were coming in to get physicals for school. And so they were seeing a lot of low risk young people. So one of the, the primary goals of this was to get more folks into the clinic. So that's the real, that's the, um, main reason why we weren't considering self-testing. But I do think there's absolutely potential for self-testing um, as a median for and leveraging social networks. So one of the studies that I didn't 
talk about here because it wasn't specific for youth. It was for, um, I have, we did do a study looking at um, black uh, LGBT, well, actually it was black gay men primarily, black and Latinx gay men. And so we would give yeah, these men uh, five test kits and say, give these out to your friends. And the idea was that when they were, their friend would do this test, they would have this person that we helped to train who gave them the test available to them to answer questions, maybe even to offer support and maybe even to go to the clinic, encourage the person to go to the clinic and go with them to the clinic um, if they tested positive. So this whole peer to peer thing that you were that you were alluding to. And we found that that actually was very successful. Um, every person who tested, they got it, they could give us the results anonymously and, and do a short survey. And so we had some information about the people who took the test, the recipients of the self-test. And what we found was that we look, we compared our data with the county's data who were doing a lot of in, making investments in HIV testing across um, Alameda County. This is where this particular study happened. And we found that through our, our strategy, we were able to identify more men who hadn't been testing regularly, more men who hadn't tested in more than a year, and more men who hadn't tested at all. And so we really were able to get into networks of of folks that weren't connected to clinics who hadn't been um, coming in for testing. And so I, I think that really, and I think that same potential exists for young people that by using the social networks of young people and allowing them to give out test kits that we might be able to access networks of um, young folks that we haven't been able to access through our typical regular means of getting young people tested. Thank you so much. It's really helpful. And it's definitely the it feels like the potential of HIV self-test kits has been elevated a little bit through um, COVID and the need for everybody to go sort of remote and not be in, you know, in the same place with folks all the time. But um, that's, that's really interesting. I have a question uh, here that I'm going to read out to you. So could you talk a little more about how you recruited the young people as researchers, interviewers, and data analysts in your study? Um, and if there's time, um, talk about how you were trained. And it's a wonderful yeah. time. Yeah, thank you. Um, so most of the young people, so we were working with this community-based agency or youth service uh, serving organization that work with young people experiencing homelessness. So they had a, a leadership program. So one of the things that they were doing in that agency was really looking to not only transition young people out of homelessness and into support, permanent supportive housing, but also provide them the scaffolding and the resources and supports needed to be, become independent and live on their own. So these young people had gone through training around um, resume building, job interviews, those kinds of things. And so we, we created some young people through, from that program. So they were transitioning out of living on the streets and had been in some um, semi-permanent housing. Uh, so we interviewed young people and, and chose uh, folks that we thought would be appropriate for the study. We also, as I mentioned, some of these young people were from, were undergrads at UC Berkeley. And so um, we looked at UC Berkeley has a program um, called the Suitcase Clinic and a food bank. And so we looked at young people who were working in those services um, and providing those services as folks who were committed and interested in this issue. And so we recruited young people from UC Berkeley who were involved in those programs. And we um, took these young people and we basically gave them a 40 hour training. So it was a week long training that talked about kind of not only the study and the details of the study, but also um, what we know about services in the city. We talked about research and research ethics and IRB. Um, and so we had to think about ways in which they would be able to be engaged to do, uh, I don't know if any of you have done that city training, it's like not that exciting. So we had to take that material and get it in a way that young people could access that, that information. So we made games and stuff. Um, quiz shows uh, in order to convey some of that information. We talked about crisis, crisis management with those young people. 
Um, we had to do some work with them also around just managing their own lives because uh, for many of these young people, they were still um, not entirely stable. So we found, we, so we learned as well. We had to provide food for them um, as not only were we giving them a paycheck, we were also feeding them for during the trainings and all of that so that folks had what they needed, their basic, uh, their own basic needs met in order for them to really fully participate. And so, and then we would do things, dry runs and practices with positive, constructive feedback. They would give each other positive, constructive feedback so we can test their, their, their learning before we actually had them out on the street, um, out on the street doing the recruitment and interviews. And in terms of the, um, of the analysis of the data, we, and you saw that one slide that had all these sticky notes. We basically had young people, we taught them about kind of basics of thematic analysis. And so we asked them to write on sticky notes when they saw, when they read through all the interviews where they saw something that they thought um, seemed like a pattern to them or really important. And they put that sticky on the board. And then we start grouping those into the themes to try to to then be able to think about what were the, 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 the beginning of, I guess, the thematic analysis that we did of the, of the interviews. Thank you. Really, really helpful. Um, I've got one other question and we have a half a minute. Okay. So, um, I'll be succinct. Like it's not I'll like, try. It's not like the radio, so we won't replace you with an ad. But um, <laughs> okay, so where do you think the next step in the resources research is for young people, such as researching something similar in Portland or another large city such as Chicago? Uh, the police and geospatial data seem so promising also. Yeah, it's my, it's my hope really to be able to extend some of this work to Oregon. And so um, Portland, like many of the cities on the West Coast are, there is a large population of folks who are experiencing homelessness. And so again, this kind, I think this kind of um, study would be helpful in thinking about and understanding what's happening for in particular young people who are experiencing homelessness in the city and begin to then identify what we might be able to do to really support those young people as they're as we are trying to transition them out of homelessness things like a guaranteed income or something that we could absolutely be able to implement um, in a place like portland and so looking to see what the opportunities might be for that um, and because uh, Portland will be a different kind of population. And so really being able to compare those populations, I think would also be very important. So I think there's a, a lot of promise. It's more like I have to have the bandwidth in time, um, but also partnerships. And so um, I'm less than a year in Oregon, but really looking forward to building out this work. Great, thank you again. Thank you so much. Just a really, really interesting, informative talk. Thanks so much for having me.